So considerations for the building envelope design, again, is to have that continuous layer of control and ideally a layer of redundancy, a backup layer, to control the heat, air, and moisture flow through our building assemblies. We'll now look at some basic concerns and we'll look at some wall assemblies and we'll talk about it with terms of moisture and now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about mold. Um, for most of our concerns, again, we're talking about creating continuous barriers from moisture and air, moisture and air typically flowing from warm to cold. Um, you know, what are the requirements for the wall? That it be structural, that it control that heat flow and the air flow and the moisture flow, that it be durable, and that it also uh, be um, cost effective uh, to, to create and to maintain. Um, moisture intrusion and migration will always occur. We've never gotten out of it. What we've gotten into now, though, is a better understanding about what happens in that movement process. Um, Scientific phenomena do impact exposed elements. Things like solar radiation um, um, to ice damming to air flows can have a really unusual effect on small parts of the building. We've gotten very good at being able to predict this, though, and understand our ability to tolerate moisture through things like the modeling tools. We've talked about the WUFI program in the past, WUFI. It's a computerized hydrothermal modeling program that we use to understand these vapor flows and help people with designs and help them examine how moisture will be redistributed when it gets within a, a building. Um, now, another thing that we can do with these tools is once we know where the moisture is going to be and when it's going to be there, we can actually predict mold. We know mold needs four things to live. It needs food, which is typically starch or sugar. It needs a temperature of 41 to 104. It needs oxygen and it needs moisture. 17% wood moisture content. We can now actually calculate exactly when that will occur to see if we can do something to prevent it from occurring. Can we create assemblies that will prevent that 17% wood moisture content from ever being realized? Yes, we can. Um, now, if it is unfortunately realized, if mold does grow, the good news is that for most people it is mimics an allergic reaction. Remove the allergen from the person's environment or remove the person from the allergen's environment, whole problem goes away. Now, the difficulty with mold uh, in terms of people's reaction to it is it varies from person to person. It can be quite severe. It is not life-threatening. There are three kinds of toxic mold that can occur in our buildings. One of them actually does get found from time to time, typically along the shores of the Great Lakes in places like Cleveland or Detroit or Chicago, and that's called Stachyobotrys A. They unfortunately have the perfect conditions for that mold to grow there. That mold is black and hairy. Not all black and hairy mold is stachyobotrys, but stachy is always black and hairy. When you see black and hairy, cover it back up and back away. Do not disturb it. Not that it's going to reach out and bite you, but when you disturb it, you can make those spores go aerosol. Now, if a child breathes in those spores into their lungs, it will actually arrest the development or the growth of the child's lung cells. So children in a household that have stachyobotrys mold in their basement have a lifetime of underdeveloped lung function. Well, that is obviously a horrible thing. That's about as bad as it gets with mold in most cases. That is extremely rare, thank goodness. Most cases, it's like an allergic reaction. People have a headache, they get a rash. You've got to clean it up and get, a, get them away from it. So what do we do? Well, we typically do try to clean it up. Mold doesn't actually eat construction products. It eats the starch and sugar from them. But mold does not have the enzymes to consume the actual fibers of the material. Fungus consumes actual fibers of material. You all seen the end result of fungus, which is dry rot. We can literally crumble a two by four in your hands because the fungus roots have enzymes that dissolve the wood fibers and make it lose all its structural properties. The reason we put the wood there is for structural properties, for bracing, rack resistance, a nailing base for a siding. If you've got fungus, it's got to come out because you've lost all those structural properties. Mold doesn't do that. You can simply clean off the mold. If you're in a non-porous sur surface like you know, a metal or a glass or a tile, it can very easily be wiped off. With a porous surface, like a paper face on a drywall, uh, it's not easy to clean it off. Now, you can kill it, make it go dormant, and dry it out and stop it, which is what we typically try to do. If the drywall is not destroyed, we'll simply hit it with a 10% bleach solution. That's 10% bleach, 90% water. Dry it out, and then keep it dry. If we keep that paper below a 17% wood moisture content, the mold won't come back. It won't grow again. Now, fortunately, typically interior wallboard is so easy to get to, we will just take it out to make the people feel better, and we'll dispose of it. How much does this cost? Uh, there are different guidelines that dictate mold remediation practices and what steps you go through and how you deal with it. 
Uh, the two extremes are the New York City guideline, which is recognized as being one of the most workable and the most affordable. Typically comes in below $14 a square foot, start to finish, to fix moldy interior spaces. Two, the EPA and the OSHA guidelines, which can run $40 to $60 a square foot and go well beyond the affected areas. So there's quite a range out there. The good news is it can be done practically, uh, it can be done inexpensively, and it can be done permanently. Once you get that moisture content down again, everything goes stagnant, dormant, no aerosol mold, no reaction. People won't react to it. If there is mold in your building, you're going to smell it. It's the best way to find it yourself. If you wonder if you've got mold in your house, get your hands and knees, call around your perimeter, and smell your outlets. If you've got it, you're going to smell it at your outlets first. If you smell it's your outlet, start peeling back the baseboard in that area and looking behind that baseboard. That's the next place you're going to see it. You will find it. If it smells bad, it is bad. It's a pretty good rule in life. It has a good way to find mold. We call it pods, portable organic detection systems, people. Send them into a building. If they react, you got it. We do it with dogs, actually. We have trained dogs that we run through buildings that will alert us to different kinds of mold that are in the building because they pick up the smell very, very quickly. So, so again, it, it's it's... For attorneys, you know, if you look at lawsuits for mold, they got a thousand pictures of guys in moon suits walking in and out of the building and respirators and all this says, it's terrorism. They're terrorists trying to terrorize juries to make them think this is the end of the world. I'll be honest, that's what it is. It's not that bad. Some of us have been on mold our entire lives. I grew up on a farm, we had a dirt basement, and we played in the basement in the winter because we couldn't make it to the barn. And we clean all the mold off our toys and wrap them in our jeans. I've been around my mold my whole life, never even had a headache. Other people, though, can have a really severe reaction. But, you know, it, it varies from person to person. It's not the end of the world. It's very easy to deal with. Um, the best way, though, if you got those four things, right, food, temperature, oxygen, and moisture, you got to knock out one leg of the stool to make the stool fall over. You can knock out temperature. You can make it too cold, right? But chances are somewhere in your building envelope, it's going to be between 41 and 104. You can try to knock out food. You can say, okay, we'll have a food-free environment. Therefore, the mold won't grow. <clears throat> doesn't work. Food shows up. Right, we talked about your shower at home. We got all that mold and that mildew. There's no starch, no sugar, nothing in all that tile and all that glass and all that vinyl. There's starch and soap. So food shows up. So you can't stay food free. All you can do is control that moisture, which is why moisture management is so critical. Mold typically does occur, moisture occurs in hidden locations, which is the problem. By the time you've noticed it, it's really got a foothold going on. It's spreading and it's going aerosol on you by the time you find out on the interior space. And where you usually find out in the interior space, the first place you actually see it is right now on the other side of that section right there, behind the baseboard, which is a non-breathing trim item, not a lot of airflow touching the drywall at all. You have material that's painted and resistive on the other side. You got a piece of painted wood trim as a baseboard or an extruded vinyl in a commercial building. They don't breathe. So that part of the drywall has had a disproportionate amount of water buildup and a lack of drying potential because there's no airflow against it. You know, you'll see people move a couch away from a wall. There's a powder of mold on the wall in the shape of the couch. Now, the couch's fault. It's just the couch is preventing the airflow against the wall to give it a drying potential. You're always going to get water in. You've got to max your drying potentials. That's the only way to live with it. Exterior moisture signs like, you know, efflorescence or rotting water, things like that, give you a pretty good reason to look inside at that same point. If you have moisture on the outside, typically you're going to have moisture somewhere interstitial to the assembly as well. You've got to look inside those places. If you see it on the outside, always look inside to make sure it didn't get in too far. So since we know that we're going to get wet, since we know water is going to intrude, what can we do? We control the way we wet, we promote drainage whenever possible, and we try to promote drying, you know, by getting airflow on the surfaces, by getting airflow through an assembly, not through horizontally, but within and without an assembly. We talked now about ventilated claddings, how much how much drying they actually promote. The building code changed in 2009 to recognize ventilated claddings to get, let you do things differently when you have something like, say, vinyl siding, which naturally is a ventilated cladding. They'll actually let you reduce the amount of vapor controls you do because you can live with more wetting. Um, drainage, right? We always put weeps. We have, we have a, a brick wall. We drain that cavity. We put weeps in the bottom. We try to ventilate it as well to get airflow through there. So every time the, air, the sun hits that wall, in a convective loop of airflow, pulling in the bottom, going out the top to get the moisture out of the wall. How much moisture gets in the wall? We talked about it before. Roughly 10% of the wind-driven rain that strikes any elevation gets past the outer surface onto the material behind it. If you have a brick cavity wall, how much water drains out of that cavity? Roughly one half that goes in. 
So 5% of your wind-driven rain is sitting back in that cavity. You got to get it out of your wall before it gets pushed through the wall by vapor pressures. How do you do that? By venting that cavity. You take some of those cell vents, you put them up top, up high in the brick, every other course. As soon as the sun hits the wall, you get airflow, boom, water's gone. You have no more problems. So in terms of our wetting strategy, some of the things we do to try to control that, again, are, are these air barriers and these vapor barriers. Trying to have continuous layers to prevent the drives, control the drives through them. Try to ventilate whenever possible. Dehumidification as a strategy is not a very good one because dehumidification, like a barrier, takes a lot of maintenance and people will not maintain them. So it's not a very good strategy to start with. It's a good desperation one though. It's an inexpensive way to go temporarily, but it's not a long-term solution. Um, your appropriate wetting strategy, how you're going to deal with it depends upon your climate. Very different for cold than for hot and humid climates. Um, you know, typically in cold climates, we don't have a lot of internal low pressures. We don't, like you know, in Minnesota, we don't crank our air conditioning in the summer, so we don't have a lot of inward vapor drive. Where you really get into it, you know, it's easy to say in the north, be resistive on the inside. In the south, be resistive on the outside. And where do you get in trouble? Everywhere in between. You got inward vapor drives in the summer, outward vapor drives in the winter. I got bad news. You got water leaking in the wall. You got water driving from both directions. You got a lot, of, a lot of water on your hands. That's where it becomes a lot more tricky is when you get into that central part of the country, especially when you're east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, in our cold climates, we would say in general, if you're going to have air leakage through the wall, if you're not going to be airtight, you've got to keep the dew point below 35 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that you have to anticipate that the moisture in your building is going to see 35 degrees. So you got to keep it drier than that. How do you do that? You go back to that really boring looking chart I showed you, that table that tells you what those vapor pressures are. You now know what the vapor pressure, the dew point is at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. It's roughly 0.2 inches of water. You go back to what temperature you're operating at on the inside. You say, oh, I'm operating at 72. That's 0.69 inches of water. What percentage of 0.69 is 0.2? That's the percentage RH you can live with in your building. That's how you do that very simple calculation. In mixed climates, which is heating and air conditioning, we talked about the climate zones in the quiz we had on the moisture management training. That's the one we trip a lot of people up on. Mixed means humid, uh, it can be humid or dry. It means heating and air conditioning. And that's where you typically have this reverse drive. Seasonal vapor drives, we call them. Inside out in the winter, outside in, in the summer. In hot climates, in general, it's outside in. So what we do is we try to get more resistive barriers on the outside, and we anticipate that we're going to get some leakage through to the inside. So on the inside, we want to be very breathable. It means no vinyl wall coverings. No vapory trotters, no fancy heavy duty faux paints. Things that are going to give you a cold resistive layer on the inside of that building because it's going to trap all the moisture driving from outside in at the worst possible place in a layer of paper, which is the next thing outside of that resistive layer. We want to keep that from happening. We want the water vapor drive through very easily to let the walls breathe to the inside. Um, so, real quickly, going through some types of assemblies the face sealed assembly or the barrier assembly depends upon an absolute barrier to keep water from getting anywhere past the outer surface. Bad idea. Bad idea. The basis of the class action lawsuits in the east in the 1990s. Barrier systems that are not properly constructed because you need a watchmaker skill to make a barrier work properly and then you need an owner who's going to maintain caulk joints. And caulk joints, even when properly done, need to be maintained every three, uh, three years. No one is looking at their caulk every three years unless they're anally retentive about their building. So usually it doesn't happen. So in typical, we say barriers, bad idea. They don't hold up very well. The only time we live with them is if we have a substrate that can tolerate getting wet. If our structural elements that support our building allow us to get wet. If we're all CMU or concrete walls, we don't care if it gets wet, to be honest. The building's not going to fall down around your head. We don't worry about that. Most of our building code requirements are about life safety issues, not about efficiencies. Life safety means that we're not going to have to fall around our heads. So for solid concrete or for masonry buildings typically, we don't worry too much about them. We do put stucco right onto block walls. We don't put in expansion joints. We don't put layers of building paper between the stucco and the block. We know the stucco is going to crack. We know the block's going to get wet. We don't care. The block can get wet. It's good at that. So we do that a little bit differently. So if we're going to do a face seal assembly, Okay, we'll accept that on top of a moisture tolerant structure, like block or concrete. Once you go into a light frame construction, be you wood or metal, ugh, it's a bad idea. Now stucco walls. Um, stucco walls are actually water managed walls. 
we thought they were barriers until so we had all this great litigation work from the 1990s looking at all these East projects. East guys said, oh, we can't be as bad as stucco. Stucco's got to be 10 times worse than we are. So we said, okay, well, to be honest, we've got to go cut stucco buildings now. We went out and we cut them up, and we learned something fascinating. Stucco, when put on top of building paper, not on top of plastic water as its barriers, not on top of products that are made to be put behind stucco but are plastic, but we actually put it on top of paper. The brown coat of the stucco, when you trowel the stucco and incorporate it into the mesh, which is why you're troweling it, to get a good bond with the mesh, because the expanded metal lath or mesh is what gives it you know, cracking resistance, it exposes water to the paper. The paper absorbs the water and it swells. If you actually go up to a stucco wall and you cut out like a one meter grid and you pull it straight out, before you put it down, look at the back side. And what you'll see is there's vertical channels in the back side of the stucco that were created by the swollen paper when it got wet and then when it dried, it dried flat. Every one of those channels leads down to a weep screed or an expansion joint every 144 square feet. Stucco is a water managed system when properly constructed. We saw a change in the 2009 building code that now said you may not put stucco on top of plastic building wraps. You can still use your plastic building wrap, but they actually want to see a layer of paper, building paper between the plastic water resistant barrier and the stucco to get that natural drainage occurring within the stucco systems again. It works extremely well. They actually are water managed systems and very, very durable when properly constructed. And properly constructed is a minimum of one layer of paper. If you look at the really good old details, the guys always use two layers of paper. And the first one was sacrificial. They let it get wet, they let it get swollen, they let it dry out. The, the backup layer was always the one doing the work. Now, modern systems often will see a plastic, water resistant barrier, but then paper on top of it. And the paper can come attached to the lath. Um, another thing to watch with stucco is this expanded metal lath is galvanized steel. It will rust if it's exposed to water. You now have water running down the backside of these panels. Okay, you're designing it in there, which means that you've got to cover that up with stucco. You need, by code, all lath must be furred off the wall in the U.S. It cannot be flat against the wall. So when picking these layers for these systems, make sure you're either using a self-furring lath or you furred it out, or else I guarantee you your lath is going to rot out in about 15 years. That's another common problem with stucco. Now, Eves, and those of you giving this presentation, this is a picture of stucco again, not Eves. Something to us in corporate marketing that we should fix. This should be a picture of Eves, which would be a similar system, but with a layer of extruded or typically molded polystyrene between the synthetic stucco and the, and the, and the sheathing or the water resistant barrier. Traditional stucco is 7 eighths of an inch thick, put on in three coats. EIFS is a polymer modified, cementitious, acrylic modified, cementitious rendering of stucco. Very thin coat. You have a base coat and a finish coat. Put on top of foam boards. Now, the old barrier eaves, which were the basis of the litigation we had in the 80s and the 90s, didn't have a drainage capacity between the foam and the wall. The new systems do, typically either in grooved foam boards, so there's grooves behind them for the water to run down, or they install a spacer to get the water to flow. But here we have the same old system where we have the insulation on the outside, which we talked about before, how important it is to cover up your framing. We see it in 2009, Energy Code, requiring us to cover up that framing with foam when we come above Zone 5 now. EFS does that very well, but it's got to be water managed. You've got to have those drainage channels, and the water's got to have a way to get out at the bottom of every system. Rain screens are a very common type of application in Europe. The closest we do on a daily basis is brick masonry walls. We anticipate some water's going to get into the wall, and we're always going to find a way to let it get back out again. Now, there's really two kinds of rain screens in general. There's completely open, and there's ones that have some seals involved. Um, with the rain screen, all the work is really being done by the water-resistant barrier back on the sheathing. That's your actual line of defense. This is really just a screen that's going to deflect a large amount of the wind-driven rain. A lot of moisture is going to get past it, but that's okay because as soon as the sun comes out or the wind kicks up, we're going to get airflow and we're going to dry all that out again. So our facade really is just that. It's just a facade. The, all the work is being done by the backup layer behind it. We have concealed barrier systems that are still rain screens that have some caulk joints in them, but we're still anticipating some water getting in because caulk joints fail. We're going to make sure that our real workhorse, our water-resistant barrier, and our flashings are installed in a shingle-like manner and always draining to the outside. Now, just to pick a material out of the wall assembly and talk about the moisture management at that layer, uh, for this presentation, sheathing was picked. To talk about different types of sheathings, and how they deal with mold and moisture. So we'll look at basically these types of sheathings and see what they mean to us in the market today. Um, 
In general, our sheathings are the last line of moisture defense. They're on top of our framing. They're often left exposed during construction, so they must be durable and have some weatherability until they get covered. We often depend on them for some kind of structural uh, basis. Really, the reason we use a wood sheathing versus a gypsum sheathing, gypsum is far preferable for a lot of reasons, but we use wood when we either need racking resistance, okay, and that's to keep our, our little, you know, our little stick-built house here from collapsing sideways, but we put that sheathing on there and we nail it, it can't fall, so it gives us that racking resistance. Or we use it for a nailing base, that we have vinyl siding or some other siding that we need to drive a nail into and we're not going to hit the studs. If we're not doing those two things, we actually want gypsum, and we'll, we'll look at, at why coming up here. We look at the old solid wood sheathings. These were very common, right? We had one buys that were gapped, um, very hard to find anymore. The great thing was they were typically local to the job site when they were used. Um, uh, they were very low energy because they were local. Uh, they had a pretty good resistance to the weather because typically that was good old growth wood. Now the problems are it's getting very expensive. Uh, and it's no longer old growth wood, actually. Now it's very immature wood, which is a big difference. You can pick up a 100-year-old stud or a 100-year-old piece of sheathing and a new piece of one by, and you just can't believe the weight difference between the two. This is softwood today. This is all starch and sugar. This is all food for mold. The old woods were very, very low moisture content. I got a house in the 1880s. I take p cut pieces of my studs. I can't even grow mold on them because there's no food in them. So you have different wood today. So we don't see this very often because of this, of this issue. Plywood. Okay, it's more expensive than OSB. We like plywood, it's a very traditional material. Um, wood absorbs moisture at the end grain. And that simple statement goes a lot of different ways. It's why you don't have to face staple insulation bats on studs. Um, it's why the face of studs don't get wet. Wood absorbs moisture at the end grain, where those capillaries are exposed to the air. This is really important to plywood and OSB. In plywood, the only place the end grain is exposed is at the edge of the board. Plywood only absorbs water at the cuts, at the edges. So on a roof assembly, when you have a plywood deck and it gets wet, you see that checkerboard pattern telegraphed through because you see all the edges are swelling. OSB, if you look at a piece of OSB, it's all exposed end grain. OSB can absorb water anywhere on the board. When OSB gets wet, the whole board blows up, not just the edges. That's really important for OSB because according to the American Plywood Association, if OSB swells by more than 15% of its original dimension and you're using it for anything structural, you've got to tear it out. It's very prone to absorb that moisture and do that swelling. It's very susceptible to moisture. So that's one of the issues with OSB, why we don't like it as much. Now, hardboards, um, these are really remanufactured waste product from sawmills that we're using. We have the old hardboard sidings, like, you know, there's a couple of manufacturers that are no longer with us because of their big lawsuits. Because what we found out with hardboards is, guess what? They're wood, and they're capillaries, and they absorb moisture from the air. And if you use these products in a place where there's humidity, man, do they react wildly to humidity changes in the air. So that's one of the biggest problems we have them. They are not very durable. Uh, they've not held up well for us at all. We don't like them typically as sheathings. We typically tried them as sheathings earlier on because they had some insulation value. We've always recognized the importance of getting some insulation on top of those studs. And typically the hardboards gave us a little bit more of that. Wood in general is about an R1 per inch. So that's one thing that wood does give us over other materials. OSB, the latest, greatest, man, because now we can take a really young tree and remember high school chemistry, high school biology now, how does the tree grow, right? The outer parts of the tree, the softwood, carry all the food and all the moisture, are full of all the capillaries. This is a great thing about OSB because we can take a three-year-old tree, chop it down and make it into a product and throw it in a wall. And it's a big sheet of food waiting for mold to happen on it. This is a down spot, you know, rapidly renewable resources, rapidly, you know, growing trees aren't necessarily the best thing for us in terms of moisture and mold control. Um, rigid Foam sheathings are really, really excellent materials for energy reasons because they cover up your framing. If you just insulate between the studs, you're only insulating 75% of your building. You've got to cover up the studs. So rigid foam sheathings are very good, but you have to be careful because rigid foam sheathings are also vapor barriers. So if you're in a cold climate and you're using one of these, which is where you want to use them, this is where you get the biggest bang for the buck, you have to control the rate at which moisture flows to them from the outside, from the inside out in the winter because or else they can sweat for you and they can cause some moisture problems. They more, are more expensive than OSB. Um, they're forbidden in places like Manhattan. Uh, there are some areas where fire codes become really important towards foam plastics. Uh, in general, the U.S. building codes measure how much flame is generated when something burns and how much smoke is generated. They don't measure the temperature of the flame and they don't measure what's in the smoke. 
And that's a big difference between us and, say, the European building codes and also New York City's building code. New York City and older cities in Europe also consider, you know, the general building code in the U.S. says you've got 15 minutes to get out of the building. We don't care if the building burns down. We're giving you 15 minutes to get out. That's what it's all about. Well, most people who don't make it out of a building on fire don't make it out because of smoke. If you get a lung full of wood smoke and some narrow st stairwell coming out of an old building, chances are you're going to feel really bad, but you're probably going to get out. If you get a lung full of plastic smoke, you're probably not going to make it. And that's why places like New York City and a lot of European building codes don't allow these materials because of what is in the smoke. And that's a big difference. Our codes may someday change, but for now, they allow foam plastics to be on the outside of our buildings because typically we're worried about getting outside in a fire. We're not worried about the outside burning off. So we put them out there very quickly and they cover up our sheathings. They do a really good job, but we must be careful because they will not breathe moisture through them. They are a restrictive layer. So they change the way moisture moves. Cement boards, very common, very popular exterior material uh, in terms of a sheathing. Two big disadvantages not mentioned on here are one, all things concrete are on the hit list. If sustainability programs in the United States continue to grow at the rate they're growing, you're going to see the use of concrete diminishing very, very rapidly. And the problem is not the concrete, it's the cement in the concrete. Portland, lime cement, or Portland cement itself, for every pound of Portland cement you make, you make one pound of carbon dioxide when you slake the lime to make the cement. So it is on the hit list for greenhouse gases. We're trying to rapidly replace how much Portland cement we use in our concrete materials. Concrete is a mixture of Portland cement with other materials, right? If we look at fiber cement sidings, um, look for recycled content in fiber cement sidings. Look for things that have replaced the cement because you're trying to reduce the amount of cement in your products every day because of this carbon dioxide issue. Um, second problem with cement boards is if you ever tried to work with one, they weigh a ton, they're a nightmare to cut, they're a nightmare to work with, they're very brittle, they're very difficult. So that's another downside of them as a sheathing. Now, in our gypsum sheathings, we used to use paper face gypsum sheathings on the outside of our buildings. We don't anymore because the paper facings fall off. If you look at a gypsum board, be it an interior product or an exterior product, once you take the facing off that board, you have a pretty unstable piece of material. They're like dry pieces of chalk. There's nothing really holding them together other than a little bit of fiber that's mixed in there once you lose your facing. Now, paper facings, paper is strong stuff. When you properly countersink a bugle head screw on a piece of drywall into a stud and you try to pull that piece of drywall over it, man, it is hard to do because you're trying to break paper. Paper's really strong. Now, we got rid of the paper on our exterior sheathings, though, because typically we leave those sheathings exposed too long. By the time we get them covered up, the paper face sheathings were getting damaged by the weather. The paper just couldn't take it. So we've gone to now glass reinforced gypsum sheathings, but there's a really big difference in the two types that are out there. There's partially embedded, which is an example of partially embedded where the glass mat is on the surface. Remember, this glass mat has replaced the paper. It's giving your board most of its rigid strength. Now, one of the issues with the partially embedded glass mats, if you've ever worked with them, is first of all, you're handling glass fibers. It's like handling fiberglass all day long. It breaks off, it gets in the air, it can be an irritant, it's a little bit annoying to work with. But more importantly is that if you cut this board, if you trim this board to shape, you can go up to that edge, that cut edge, and you can grab that facer with your fingertips and peel it right off. The partially embedded facers are barely held onto the boards once you cut them. That becomes really important because, again, that facer is all your structural rigid strength, giving that board its shape. Now, the second type of product out there is a fully embedded one, um, which it takes care of this issue. This is the only real disadvantage of that sheathing. It's only partially embedded, so it's got these issues with handleability and with structural strength once they've been trimmed. The fully embedded glass mat is the other type. Because the glass mat is now embedded inside the board, when you cut the board, you can't get at it. You don't lose your strength. So it enjoys all of the same properties as the partially embedded in terms of being a moisture-resistant core, um, preventing absorption, preventing uh, you know, getting wet, high breathability. These materials typically are 30 perms or higher, breathe moisture through very easily, give you a great drying potential, and be fully embedded, you've lost your only disadvantage. So there we've looked at several different types of sheathing materials that all go to the same place that behave completely differently. Choose which one works best for what you're doing. If you need a nailing base, you can't use gypsum sheathings as your nailing base. You can't hang siding on gypsum sheathing. You've got to hit the studs. But if you're not using it for that, they are really clearly great moisture management choices. Okay, we've covered all the topics that we promised we'd cover in the time we said we'd do it. Um, we didn't talk about any brand names, which we're always very careful to do when we're doing that. The presentation is now clearly over. 
Okay, so once the presentation's over, two of the hooks that were set out there to the audience that you want to pick up on is one, I said never use peel and stick membranes as an air barrier on the outside in a cold climate because if you use the interior vapor retarder, you're violating a cardinal rule of construction. Never create two vapor barriers. Certain Teat has the only solution in the marketplace to that. We have the vapor barrier that's not a vapor barrier. We've got the membrane smart vapor retarder that changes its permeance. Under normal conditions, it'll act like a vapor retarder on the inside until water gets inside that wall. And then it opens up and becomes breathable, lets all the moisture dry out to the inside, and then it snaps shut again. We're the only ones in the world that have it. So we always like to bring that back up. Oh, any of our TMs, any of our people in the field, when you see someone doing a design, putting peel and stick membrane on the outside of the building in a cold climate, man, you got to say, oh, by the way, we're using for your vapor retarder on the inside because we got something that solves your problem. That's the membrane. Another big hook I threw out there was for the fiber cement siding. We talked about cement. Cement is on the hit list. We're supposed to be reducing our consumption of cement. Fiber cement's done that. Compared to their competition, they've got the 50, oh, plus 40% recycled content using the fly ash. Very, very positive, diverting thousands of metric tons of landfill into the product and reducing the carbon footprint of the product by half. So a tremendously green thing to be doing that no one else has in the marketplace as well. So those are always two things to bring up again after the presentation's over to uh, talk about uh, certain key products. Again, you can't talk about our products during a presentation, but you can float some softballs out there that you'll circle back on afterwards like that. Thank you very much for watching. Good luck with the presentations. Uh, anything we can do to help, uh, just give us a call and let us know.